Welcome to AP Wealth's Informed Investor Market Update, a series dedicated to keeping you involved in what's going on in the stock market, the economy, and other areas of interest to EP Wealth. Joining me today, Adam Phillips, Director of Investments at EP Wealth, giving us the updates that I just mentioned on the Informed Investor Market Update Outlook. Um, let's do a quick report card, and I shouldn't say um, but the quick report card, we're almost done with half of the year. We're entering that final week of June. Gains broadened last week. That's the thing that I noticed that we're going to talk about. The S&P 500 is up 14.6% for the year. The NASDAQ up 17.8% for the year, but last week it was unchanged. The mid-cap 400 S&P index up 1.3% last week, up 5.4% for the year. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is up 3.9% for the year, but it had a good week, up 1.5% last week. And the Russell, it's still struggling, down three-tenths of 1% for the year, but it too was up almost 1% last week, up eight-tenths of 1%. Adam, am I reading it correctly that last week may not have been record gains every single day on the S&P 500, but because there was a broadening, maybe it was a healthier market for us to look at? I think that's one way to look at it, and we're certainly happy to see some broadening out. I think the question is whether it's going to continue. You know, the the we talked about the breadth story last week, Rob, and so just to put some additional data behind it, if you look at the top ten stocks, we were talking about how just a handful of names, those largest names in the S and P five hundred, were really driving most or basically all the gains. So if you look at the ten largest stocks in the S and P five hundred, the median return for those top tens uh, over the last three months is about 17%. The remaining 490, that median return is down about 1%. So about an 18% difference. And, and so that really tells you that we, we, we've we seen a, a lot of, uh, of leadership there at the top and it's been very narrow. So to the extent that this can broaden out, I think that's great. I think what we've seen the last few days is, is really interesting and it's something we're gonna keep an eye on. I, I try not to get too much into the individual names here. Uh, and keep compliance happy. But I think it is worth noting that uh, NVIDIA is is in correction territory right now. Now it, it's off a little bit more than 10%. And I mention it just because it has been the source of so much of the gains for the overall index um, o- over the last several months. And so it's still, the, the return on a year-to-date basis is still, is still extremely positive. But um, I, what what everyone is waiting to see is whether the market can perform well um, if if Nvidia is lagging a little bit. If we can see this this um, a more durable leadership rotation or, or broader participation, the jury's still out. But I think it, this is really the test that a lot of people have been waiting for. So I think it's going to be interesting to watch here in the coming days and weeks. It's interesting because I've been in this industry a while. Um, they used to say if your cab driver has a stock tip for you, probably want to avoid it. Now, I guess they'd say if your Uber driver has a stock tip for you, and I get to, everyone's been talking about NVIDIA recently, um, but I have no market opinion on the stock. Um, let's let's change to politics, because I think this is going to be an interesting week. Um, Wall Street has bets on Biden winning. Wall Street has bets on Trump winning. What would be better for our economy? But there's also an international election this week. So we get two very key events this week. We get a debate in the United States, and then we get the French elections. Um Let's talk about both of those, because I think uh, they're headline news that people want to know about how it's going to affect their their bottom line. Yeah, you know, I I think that one could argue that the election season really gets underway on Thursday um, with this with this first and what could be the only debate. I I think we'll see. Um, But it's going to be really interesting. I don't know that that it's really going to change the minds of anyone that's already, you know, I I would imagine that most. Democrats and Republicans have already made up their mind and they're going to remain loyal. I think what's going to be interesting is is where the independents lie um, after this and if their opinion changes one way or another, since it really is going to come down to, I think, a couple of swing states and and, uh, key voting areas this election season. I think it is just going to be such a tight race. The polls are saying one thing. The um, if you look at just different baskets of stocks based on how they're trading, what they're saying about um, a a potential um, election outcome come November, I think it's it's saying something a little bit different. And so, at this point, it remains too close to call. And so that's why, from an investment standpoint, we're not making any decisions, but really just talking about how we might reposition portfolio uh, come November based on the election outcome. So I think it's going to be interesting. Um, certainly. Uh, just a lot more noise for us to uh, to contend with, but it's one that we're going to be mostly in Europe. 
Um, we are going to be watching um, this weekend, actually, on the 30th of June, it is the first um, election, uh, the first of two. So President Macron, about uh, two weeks ago or so, called snap elections there. Um, and uh, I, I think many are still kind of scratching their head about it since uh, his party is, uh, in all likelihood, they're going to lose um, quite a bit of seats to the far right party. Um, which is uh, uh, Marie Le Pen's party. And so I think the question there is what comes of that? We've seen some movement there in the French, uh, France's uh, stock market. We've seen it in their bond yields as well, what they call the oats. Um, but I think it, it's interesting and it's going to inform our overall opinion of, of that region because depending on who comes out of that with control, it could dictate uh, things like the, the deficit over there, which they have their own spending issues. And the far right uh, party is, uh, is certainly leaning into some policies that aren't too budget friendly. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I think that's some of the things that, we, that we're watching and why um, I think we're, we're interested in, in, the, in the outcome and what implications that might have. So it's gonna be an interesting week for sure. Yeah, and uh, it's never comfortable talking politics. It's never comfortable talking how much cash you have in your wallet. But um, it's things that our industry, we really have to confront and think about um, and be prepared for. Um, let's talk this week. I'm not seeing a lot of data that looks terribly important. Now, I'm not you. You're a much bigger picture than I am. And you do bullet shots into individual issues way better um, than most. Uh, the PCE seems to me to be the thing that we'll be paying attention to trying to tie to what will the Fed think of this. Um, the PCE comes out on Friday. Give us a little thoughts on what PCE might mean to us. So the PCE, the personal consumption expenditures, it's so it's uh, it, it's important because it is the Fed's preferred inflation measure. We look at the we get the CPI, the consumer price index, then we get the PCE. So they look at the core PCE. Um, that means it's it's excluding food and energy prices. That's why uh, where we are we think it's important uh, to keep an eye on that uh, in the first place. But I will just highlight the fact that um, we get we always get this data point after we get the um, the CPI, that other inflation measure, as well as PPI, which is the producer prices index, and both of those help to inform our expectations and, and the overall expectations of the market uh, for what this PCE print is going to be. And so you don't see a whole lot of surprises here um, because of that. And so what the market is currently expecting is for, on a monthly basis, the core, again, excluding food and energy prices, the core PCE um, to rise about one tenth of a, of, of a percent on a month over month basis. If that happens, it's going to be the lowest rate of, uh, of price change or inflation um, is so far this year. So that's going to be um, some pretty good progress, uh, certainly Fed friendly. On a year to date basis, that number will come out to about 2.6%, uh, which if that is the case, it'll be the lowest in over three years. And so very, very Fed, Fed friendly. I don't think that that's necessarily going to change anything. Uh, at their next meeting, which is scheduled for July 31st. Uh, I think that they're still going to be too hesitant to, to jump the gun. They want to wait and see how, how certain things uh, play out here with respect to the, the labor market and overall prices. We know that service inflation, uh, things like insurance prices uh, are, are still on the rise. There's still a lot of pressure there. And so I don't necessarily think it's going to change anything, but uh, I, I uh, but I still think the Fed's going to be watching it and and kind of putting it away, uh, you know, along with other other data points that are that they're looking at. I'll tell you the other one that we get on a weekly basis that we're watching more uh, is the initial jobless claims data, and so we get that. It is a more timely measure of the of the labor market uh, because it does come out every week, and we've seen that this number has started to move higher, and so because we get it every every week and it tends to be, it can be a little bit noisier. Uh, we look at it on a four week moving average basis and on a four week move, moving average, the number has actually, it's actually up about 13% from where it started the year. Now, granted, it's still very low uh, on in absolute terms. It, it's coming off of a very low base, but it is starting to tick higher. And so that could suggest um, addition, more people being laid off and filing for unemployment benefits. Um, it, it has historically been a leading indicator uh, for a rising unemployment rate. And so that's one of the reasons that, that we're watching it. And so if this moves higher, that might tell us that maybe that unemployment rate, which is currently about 4%, it could start to tick higher here in the coming months. 
So a lot of interesting stuff for now. I think the labor market is, is in great shape. Uh, we're not too concerned about it, on, um, just generally speaking. But, um, but I, I think it just, uh, you know, it just tells you there's a lot of uh, data points to keep an eye on. You know, inflation is just one of them. We're, we got a lot that we're constantly monitoring. Now, I'm not a managing director of investments at EP Wealth, but let's talk a little bit more about this first time unemployment claims and see if you could help me a little bit. I've been doing this for a long time, and over my 25 years, I've always seen the number kind of generalized. Any number under 350,000 is a healthy economy. Any number above 350,000 first time unemployment claims, you've been laid off, you go to the unemployment office. So any number over 350 is kind of bad. Do you have a divining rod in your head? Because that's kind of the number I've come up with through years of just watching other people come to conclusions on the first time unemployment gains. Yeah, I mean, my my number has historically been, you know, closer to 300 okay. uh, as a long term average. And so we're certainly well below that right now where we've been, you know, kind of hovering around 230, 240. Okay. Um, and so that is it sounds like a lot, right? A lot of people on a weekly basis filing for first time unemployment benefits, 230,000. That's that's not insignificant. But in terms of just a, a long term average, that's that's certainly well below it. And so I think that that's good. And, um, you know, even though it is ticking higher, it's coming off of a low base. So I, I think that is something to keep in mind. We also get the continuing uh, unemployment claims. And so how many people continue to to claim those benefits? And so we look at that too. That number is um, you know, quite a bit higher, but but we we that helps to tell us how quickly these people that are being laid off are finding a new job. And so we we look at both of them. Um, and and so I, I think again, it's one figure. Unfortunately, you know whether you're looking at inflation with PPI, CPI, PCE, all these fun you know fun acronyms. Um, you know, what one data won't tell you uh, everything you need to know. And that's why we look at multiple. I got one more thing that I have to ask. Um, I saw today that global international travel is going to hit almost 1 trillion. It's higher than pre-pandemic levels. Mm. I just kind of, I want to go back and talk COVID with you for just a second. Now that we're starting to get the comparisons, not pre-COVID, COVID, post-COVID, post -COVID, um, as a guy who looks at the economy um, for a living, who looks at the stock market for a living, are we there? Like, can, can we say we're no longer looking at pre-pandemic numbers and seeing where we are? We're we're moving forward. It's going to be something on that long-term chart that, yes, it happened like World War II happened, like World War One happened. Is COVID behind us? Ooh, that, that's a loaded question. I don't I know. I, I, you know, I, I would say that, yeah, we're starting to see some normalization, okay. I, I think is the best way that I would say it, right? Is is it's going to be a, a certain point in time when we look at the long-term history and say, okay, this was the COVID period, right? And when, in the charts that I look at you, there's a gray portions and that, and that represents uh, recessions, right? And so maybe right. there's going to be a, a different shade of gray and that represents COVID and part of that uh, as a recession. Uh, you know, I, I, I think that we are seeing normalization. We've seen what was uh, at first revenge travel. I think yeah. a lot of people called it, um, and and I think that's just been, uh, you know, we we've seen that ongoing spending, and and people obviously feel good; they want to enjoy themselves. Um, we've seen pent up uh, accumulated savings. I think a lot of people have eaten through that, but again, I I think this is it gets back to what we've been talking about is the the tale of um, uh, it's like tale of two economies, right? The haves and the have nots, and there's okay. certain consumers and households that are in great shape. Right. And, and, you know, an example is those that have a, you know, currently have a home that they that they are in and, and they locked in a great mortgage. Not the case for a first time home buyer that's out there trying to 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 get into a, a secure property and with with low inventory um, or those that have um, still they have savings where they're earning five percent on their money. Right. So it's those people that have the ability to spend. And I think what we're watching from the economic standpoint is what happens going forward. Um, and I think Friday's number, that consumption figure is going to tell us uh, a little bit more about how people are feeling uh, across across the economy. Uh, and so that'll that'll really help to inform, is this travel sustainable? A lot of that is uh, is due to the fact that the labor market has has remained firm. It, it's remained strong. And so as if we see uh, layoffs start to pick up, then that's when people um, you know, might not be as uh, as eager to spend that discretionary income. Really good stuff. Great update. Um, I'm glad I asked that question because I think a lot of people are thinking of it. Um, and I understand that different countries are going to cover it at different paces. And I understand we could probably spend a whole hour on the topic. So maybe, maybe again, some time in the future. 
I'm Rob Black for EP Wealth's Informed Investor Market Update. He is Adam Phillips, Managing Director of Investments at EP Wealth. Good day. Good day.